This presentation has way more information in it than I'll have time to actually do in detail, but it's out there in the PDF file and easy to look at. And I want to talk about some of the principles and some of the guiding um, factors in developing workflows uh, for a collection. So um, I'm going to start talking about what the value of a workflow is. Um, one of the way, one of the things that workflows do can do for you, if you develop the workflow, is it can promote efficiency and even promote automation in some instances, where you begin to realize repetitive tasks or roadblocks that you can either eliminate uh, and, and then perhaps uh, automate. So it's always uh, one of the things that you want to look for when developing workflows is efficiency and automation, uh, routing and scheduling of activities, um, balancing work uh, workloads among technicians which then ensures that as you transition from one part of the workflow to another, you don't have a bottleneck because one part of that workflow is overloaded uh, and the other part never either never get work to do or doesn't get it in time, or that so much work is being fed out of one section of the workflow into another that the receiving end of this workflow can't keep up with the folks serving in information. So very important. Um, uh, you want to be able to track your task, foster collaboration. That's a, I think one of the things that we forget in workflows oftentimes are transition periods. You know, you've got these steps that, that happen in a workflow. Sometimes we forget about the transition between one technician and another uh, within an imaging workflow or within a data access workflow. And sometimes that transition is very important because it's, it's in that sort of interface that the technicians can help provide information back or improving that workflow and improving that transition from one place to another. So that's an important thing uh, to think about. Um, and it promotes uh, continuous evaluation and redesign. Again, I don't believe you ever build a workflow that is static. I think every workflow that you'll design will be a workflow that needs to be constantly reviewed, constantly updated, and that you should provide methodologies for your technicians to provide information back to you so that you can redesign those workflows as you go along. One really good way to do that, um, and I've tried this two ways, uh, one really good way to do that is to give uh, your technicians a, a copy of the document in Word and let those technicians then enter into that document things that they find that work well for them. Sometimes three technicians will do the same thing but each one slightly differently and if it works for them and they get to the same end, that's a good thing. The problem with that is you never want to let the technicians just edit the workflow for everybody. They're editing their own copy of the workflow for themselves, and you need to review it. Because sometimes that editing makes it faster because they left some stuff out. And you, you know, <laughs> so now I can really move along, but I'm just not going to do that part. So you can't, you can't let the folks that are designing the technicians that redesign the workflow do that for everybody, and you can't do it in the absence of review. But you can pick up sometimes very good information by letting your technicians uh, give you information about what works best for them. It's easy to think about how well all things work in the abstract. But oftentimes that abstract, when you hit the deck with it, um, the technicians just don't see it that way. And so it's good to make sure you have this constantly uh, revolving uh, door of information. Um, so there is a ton of stuff here. So that's Kyle down there. Um, so I uh, So, uh, you know, when you start, when you start with a workflow, you've got a pre-plan. You've got to decide what database you're planning for, what camera system you're planning for. Uh, one of the hardest parts of this job for me is planning in the abstract for a huge um, kind of a global workflow that could be then applied to many small workflows. I would much rather be in an institution and know where my specimens are, what camera I've got, what database I'm using, what people are available to me, and then be able to design a workflow around that particular instance. That's a much simpler job than designing these global workflows uh, that then you have to break down for a specific institution or a specific job. I will say that there is a team of people, some of whom are in this room, working on workflows for wet collections right now, and they are uh, on a, in a Google Doc being developed they will be ready shortly. We did not get them ready for this workshop. That was my fault. I got the cart before the horse and started working on entomology workflows and then ended up doing the wet collections workshop first. So the entomology stuff's done for late April, but the wet collections, they're not done yet, but they will be shortly. There's a good group of folks that's putting these together. So um, we will have those workflows available for 
modules, uh, hopefully within the next, well, by the end of March, I think. And then we'll send that information out to everybody. So I think that you, you know, you've got to identify um, one thing that's very important is I think you've got to identify in very strict detail all of the steps that need to be accomplished. Like we were talking about with Brian this morning, leave nothing out. The best way to do that is to sit down at a computer and do it yourself, walk through the whole thing, take a picture of every screen, write down every step. I worked with one fellow that I thought, this is crazy. He was writing down things like, you know, the technician comes in the room. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, you know, he's got to do that. And, then, you know, and the technician turns on the computer. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, like, they'll figure that out. And if they can't turn on the computer, wrong technicians. <laughs> so, so, but that is absolutely the precision of the detail you should put in your workflow. Leave nothing out. Do every step all the way through. Otherwise, what happens is you forget one of those steps in some imaging process, and then all of your images get batch processed incorrectly. And you don't find that out until you've got a thousand or two thousand images done, and then you realize something was left out or not done correctly. So it's very important to go through that workflow, and after you go through the whole thing, and write it all down, then you repeat that, and actually do it as though you were a technician to make sure that it makes sense to you, and then you let a technician do it, and be there for them to ask, ask questions about, I don't know what this statement means. So it's very important to be excruciatingly detailed as you go through a developing workflow. The term dependencies, transitions, and iterations, we're going to look at that in just a minute. Workflows are not generally linear. There are all sorts of iterative steps within workflows, and you really need to take advantage of them uh, and, and learn where they, uh, where they belong. You need to know what dependencies there are, what has to come before this task can be accomplished. What do you have to accomplish first? You've got to lay all that out to be able to figure out what your next step in your workflow will be and then to define it um, uh, in, in detail. I don't know if it's on this slide or not, but um, very big fan of modular workflows. Um, think about the tasks that you have to accomplish, break those into modules, like an imaging module and an image processing module and a data extraction module, maybe a pre curation module, maybe a trans transportation module that gets specimens to and from, from the uh, storage location to the station and back to the storage location. Uh, come up with a module that defines how you reshell um, specimen jars. Uh, all of that stuff is very important. And then, once you get those modules laid out, then you can begin working on the specific tasks for those modules so that you can better then assign those tasks to individuals to get the work done. So, very important to think of the modular approach. What you'll find very quickly is, as you begin to develop a workflow for a particular module or a particular task, that the steps become um, a huge number of steps. You think it's a very simple thing. You know, turn on the computer, enter the data, all done. But that enter the data part can be, you know, hundreds of steps, it seems like, to get it done correctly. So it's very important to analyze all of those things. Um, and then diagram it in a way that your technicians can understand it. Doesn't have to be a fancy workflow diagram, but there has to be some, some linear process to that. Um, so in, in these modules, there are, some, there are various cycles and dependencies. Some of these, uh, some things in your workflow are one-time non-recurring things, like maybe setup. You're going to set the equipment up the first time, you've got your imaging station going, that's a one-time deal. It doesn't happen tomorrow, it doesn't happen next week. Set up, it's going. Unless you're moving it around in your institution. But if you're not, then you've got to figure out what that setup is, and that should be well documented because as soon as you move from your facility to another facility, if you don't have that well documented and you did this a year ago, you'll have to go through a lot of research to figure out how to do it again and you don't want to do that. I know, me by the mic. I hate the mic. <laughs> so, so once recurring and then there are other, the once non-recurring, then there are some recurring tasks that you have to think about, things that are done over again but maybe not uh, continuously. And then there are some episodic tests and things that happen once in a while. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and I don't know why I left the thing off the side software update. That should be an episodic test too, uh, where you're tweaking uh, and taking care of updates in software. So think of the workflow not as one line. Think of the workflow, this is the business process modeling approach. Business process models think about things like in a swimming pool, where there are lanes, and there are certain things happening in these lanes. And sometimes those lanes interact with each other, and sometimes they don't. So if you think about this diagram right here, from top to bottom, left to right, you 
sort of get the idea. The top two are sort of one-time events. System configuration, equipment setup, software configuration, equipment setup is in these is a setup, non-recurring task. You gotta know what those are and you gotta have a, a, a modular task list to make that happen. Um, the main workflow in this case starts at the left. Notice every place that there's a little a circle, that's an iterative task. It happens over and over again. You know, I oftentimes see workflows that if you really follow them logically the way they say you do it, it would work. I mean, because there are things that have to happen several times somewhere along the step. So here, for example, uh, pre-digitization curation, that's probably an iterative step in this overall workflow. You're performing the same task to a group of specimens until you get a lot of specimen, that's a bad word, until you get a group of specimens that you want to actually digitize, and at that point, that group of specimens moves to an imaging station. So there may be many iterations of that before that happens. And in that iteration, there may be conservation activities once in a while. So you have to think about these branching things. So you're going through your collection, and then you realize, oops, I hit a set of jars that need uh, new uh, fluid. So I'm gonna have to set these aside and get my conservation person to top these things off or do whatever you do to, to uh, replace fluid. So very important to think about those branchings out to these once in a while events. Um, uh, selection of the uh, specimen, that's a, an entirely, uh, that's an entire module in itself where you have to have specific guidelines for how are you gonna uh, select the specimen that you want to actually digitize. And what is your overall, again, overall policy for digitization? Are you digitizing everything? Are you digitizing exemplars? What are the rules for selecting that exemplar? Who do you want to assign that rule to? Uh, which, te which type of technician might be able to make that decision? Is that a curator decision? Do you have um, students that can make that decision? Do you have assistant curator that can make that decision? Very important uh, to think through uh, where those happen. And then transport, uh, data entry, iterative event, uh, and then determine, and, and there's also conservation again. I think that you should plug conservation into your workflows in several places because you can, you can, uh, different technicians will see different um, places in your workflow that conservation might should occur. So again, you want to ensure that you do everything when you have an opportunity. Don't set it aside and come back and do it later. Now there are uh, times when you hit something that you say, well, this will need conservation, but it doesn't need it now, so I'm not gonna break the chain to imaging. I'm gonna go ahead to imaging, get that done, and I'm gonna route that back after imaging to conservation. You just have to have a method, tracking method, to make sure that occurs. So, um, uh, so if we did it, we might from time to time, um, if you're using specify, you may from time to time have to tweak that. You may get an update from specify that you have to do something to, uh, it may wipe out all of your forms um, because if you're like me, you didn't put them in the database, and so then you've got to spend a week redoing that. Um, you need to learn not to do that. That's a, <laughs> that's a bad thing. I, uh, I developed a whole lot of forms, and Andy didn't tell me that if I stored them on the computer, that next time I got an update, it was going to wipe them all out. And so I had all these form boy that was right. for the technicians. <laughs> they were really good, and one day I get this call that says, you know, this just doesn't look the same anymore. There's all these extra fields. What do I do with those? Said, just don't touch anything until I get there. Um, and then that's when I found out that you really need to store your forms in, in the database so that they don't get wiped out and get an update. Anyway, so you, you sometimes have to tweak your software. Things change. You decide you add fields. You're going to do something a little differently. You've got a new data element you want to include. You're going to change your form to accommodate it. Uh, so that tweaking occurs episodically too. Then if you decide to image, you may also do um, some conservation and image time. Your imaging technician may see some things with specimens, particularly if these specimens are now being extracted from a container. And you say, oh, I see some stuff that I need to deal with here. Well, that's a, a very good time to, to branch out to some kind of conservation activity. So I don't really consider a conservation workflow as a digitization workflow. I mean, I think conservation is uh, initiated in lot, for lots of reasons. Um, so you, but you need to have a conservation workflow that you can branch to in case you have specimens that need that. Um, and then uh, you've got to return to the shelf uh, and shelf correctly. So that, that's sort of the general uh, workflow that cuts across virtually all kinds of collections. But each one of those needs, needs its own task list detailed for your particular institution.
Um, so when I say a sample detail pass list, this is a sample, one sample detail pass list. It says open the two software packages, open another software package, open the default um, uh, MCC file, which is for Nikon, it's a file that controls uh, a set of parameters that you said earlier. And there's a workflow for that, how to set that earlier in a one-time type of workflow. So I'm not going to read all this, but you see the point I'm making. It needs to be very detailed, leave nothing out, leave nothing unturned. Um, so this is an important thing and difficult for academic institutions. You really need to define tasks, and tasks are assigned to roles, not to people. So you want to develop roles for your, for your workflow, and then you want to assign people to roles. Now in a perfect world, if you're hiring people, what do you do? You interview folks, you talk to them, you find the people that have the skills you need, and then you can assign them to roles. And working with students that you get sometimes just from wherever, that may not work quite as well, so you may have to sometimes assign the role to the person. Um, you may have to look at that slightly different. But in a perfect world, you really want to assign uh, tasks to roles, not people, because roles, generic roles, are easier to maintain than roles designed for one person because they have a set of skills that you can use. So very important in that regard to think about the people that you're assigning roles to. Um, associate modules in your workflow with a single role. Um, require more than one, one role should be divided into separate modules. If it looks like your, your module is requiring um, more than one role to accomplish it, then divide it up. And the only person that can do that really is you as you design workflows. So follow a modular approach. Assign roles deliberately. Uh, what will happen to you is you will end up with that really rare, great student who can do anything. But when you get that person, and you will, when you get that person, then you have to be very deliberate about what that person ends up with. And you need to assign them the things that are easiest to foul up because you know they'll probably get it correct. And this is, as far as I'm, my personal experience, this is the only time where you might actually um, kind of assign tasks based on the skill of the person. Uh, and I think that's just because of the nature of the business we're in. That we, we don't, we can't always go out and hire our folks and do skill tests. We sometimes have to take uh, who we get. And sometimes those folks have nothing to do with biology. Actually, sometimes the investments have nothing to do with biology. Um, and some of the best ones I saw at, uh, at Yale in the entomology collection was a linguist. Um, uh, the guy, uh, guy I worked with at FSU um, was a uh, math major and uh, specializing in calculus and, and high math. And he just had this really knack for doing anything. Uh, he could do anything he asked him to do. So sometimes you, when you find those folks, then you have to use those talents. But by and large, you want to assign roles deliberately and you want to create clear, succinct, complete task lists, like I said before. Um, you want to figure out how to make things efficient, and your technicians can do that because they can tell you right quick what's boring them to death. Um, and, and that's the other issue too. If you if you you can bore people to death, you can bore people right out of your collection um, if you're not careful by continuing to take somebody that's really you know it's like the old adage if you're really good at your job you'll probably never get a promotion. Well, that's what happens to technicians sometimes. They're really good at what they're doing, so they don't get a promotion. So in that way, you know, if that happens, your best bet is to try to figure out how to use these talented folks in more than one thing. So maybe they do, maybe they're assigned two roles a day, or maybe Monday they do something, and Tuesday they do something else. You know, think through that so that, because efficiency oftentimes is built on um, effective assignment of roles as much as it is on thinking through how a robot would do it. I mean, if an automaton can do it, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to fit a person for a huge long period of time. So think through ways to vary, vary that. Um, conservation of movement, uh, that's important. I, I, you know, I've seen, I've seen set, setups where you know, the, the, the um, specimens are here, the camera is here, the right hand is here, and the mouse has snapped the pictures over here. And so they get it set up, and they do an adjustment, and they go over here and snap the picture. Uh, it's just, you know, think about that conservation of movement, and don't allow that to happen. Otherwise, it gets very tiring for the technician that's trying to make that work. Um, so, um, multitasking, I think 
good technicians can make the most of downtime. If you've got a situation where, let's say, your um, imaging and image processing takes some bit of time, what can you do while that image is processing? And what can your technician do? Now, it requires a technician that can do one thing while something else is going on and then remember what that other thing was when they get back to it. But that's also a way for you to make things a little more efficient and, and cut down on wait time for activities to happen. Um, come up with simulated tasks. Uh, come up with simulated tasks and try to simulate your workflows so that um, uh, you can watch them work and then watch for the bottlenecks and the ineffective, inefficient uh, strategies in your workflow. Any questions about that? I know it's late. Yeah. So I was just going to say, since you're talking about bottlenecks, um, you're, yeah, everybody who's doing that, well, there you go, will tell you where, where those are, and then you can think also about another way to break those up, is to chop them into smaller pieces, or assign more people to them, um, or ask the person who's doing it, 